Well, good morning from the uh, United States East Coast and good evening or good afternoon, wherever you might be around the world. Um, it is my great honor and pleasure uh, to welcome you to the inaugural event of the India China Institute's Fall 2021 series. My name is Mark Frazier, and I'm a co-director of the India China Institute, and I'm happy to report that I'm speaking to you from the New School campus, from my office in the Department of Politics here, uh, a little bit above Washington Square Park, uh, a little bit north of there, uh, where it is UN General Assembly Week here, and the traffic uh, is, is uh, as it usually is, very crowded outside my window. Uh, also, uh, it's great to say that uh, the new school uh, and our classes have, have opened uh, a few weeks ago and we're in, enjoying for the first time in a year and a half uh, in-person classes, albeit mass. And we hope soon enough that we'll be able to bring uh, you our India China Institute events in some kind of combination of being both uh, online in a webinar format, but also rather than in my office, then in, uh, eventually at a live auditorium. But uh, for today's, event, as, as you know, we're remaining in, in the webinar format and taking advantage of, of the fact that we can uh, host so many of you around the world for it. Um, today's talk uh, on the transformation of water politics in Asia, I think, is a great example of how uh, the climate crisis and various other intersecting global crises that come with that uh, can be very productively and very creatively uh, analyzed, discussed, and thought about uh, by drawing upon the humanities and social sciences and indeed natural sciences that no single of those fields and no discipline, single discipline within those fields can really adequately uh, address and, and comprehend and, and come up with solutions for something like uh, the climate crisis and the water crisis uh, that we'll be talking about today. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Sunil Amrath, who is the Renu and Anand Davan Professor of History at Yale University. Uh, his areas of interest include environmental history, the history of migration, and the history of public health. He was a MacArthur Fellow in 2017, and in 2016, the recipient of the Infosys Prize in the Humanities. His most recent book, published in 2018, Unruly Waters, uh, which you can see over my right shoulder there on the bookshelf, uh, is a history of the struggle uh, to understand and control the monsoon uh, and its consequences, uh, and its consequences of not happening, as he points out, in the drought periods in modern South Asia. He's also the author of prize-winning books, among them Crossing the Bay of Bengal, The Furies of Nature and the Fortunes of Migrants, from Harvard University Press in 2013. Uh, he's also the author of Migration and Diaspora in Modern Asia, in 2011, and Decolonizing International Health in 2006. He's currently at work on a, what sounds like a fascinating project, an environmental history of the modern world, uh, to be published with W.W. W. Norton, uh, currently, I guess, a working title called The Ruins of Freedom. He also has some very interesting uh, collaborative projects uh, that I'd like to point out. One, a history of air pollution and, and health in India, one uh, on climate change and migration, and one on water-related disasters in South and Southeast Asia. Before joining the faculty at Yale, uh, he was the inaugural Mera Family Professor of South Asian History at Harvard University in 2015 to 2020, and before that, uh, 10 years or so, at Birkbeck College at the University of London. So after he, his uh, talk, which we, we plan uh, to go for 30 or 30 minutes or so, uh, we will have uh, comments from a, a discussant, our distinguished uh, discussant today, welcoming uh, Sofia Kalantzikos, who is Global Distinguished Professor in Environmental Studies and Public Policy at New York University. And she has also been a longtime affiliate at NYU Abu Dhabi. Her work explores, as I alluded to earlier, the, the uh, payoffs and, and, and creative ways that we can think about global problems by bridging the humanities and the social sciences. And indeed, she is the founder of an organization called eArt Humanities uh, and the Environmental Humanities Research Institute at NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, 
Uh, in the summer of 2020, she launched a project entitled the Geopolitics and Ecology of Himalayan Water, which addresses growing water insecurity for the 2.5 billion people in the region. She's the author of uh, China and the Geopolitics of Rare Earths, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2018, and also uh, a book published in 2017, The EU, the US, and China Tackling Climate Change. Her current project, uh, again related to today's topic, is on the geopolitics of melting mountains. She has had a number of distinguished fellowships at various places around the world, including, including a Rachel Carlson Fellowship, Carson Fellowship at LMU Munich in 2015 and 2018, a Fung Global Fellowship at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies in 2019, and last year uh, as a senior fellow at the Research Institute for the History of Science and Technology at Caltech and the Huntington. So I'll now turn uh, the platform over to Professor Amrith and uh, please uh, join me in welcoming, welcoming him to ICI. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you so much, Mark, for that really generous introduction and also for the invitation. This is uh, a talk that I think has been on the cards for several months. And of course, much has happened in the world since we first started talking about this. I'm really happy um, to be here with all of you. So thank you. Um, I would like to uh, reflect as a historian, as a historian of South Asia, primarily uh, on the transformative decade of the 1980s, where I see um, a number of converging material as well as intellectual transformations, which to some extent I think sort of set us on the course uh, towards our current situation, um, which is something that I very much look forward to hearing from Sophia about that and, and to sort of discuss the current scenario further. I'll talk a little bit more about the sort of how we got here. Um, I'd like to begin with a now iconic series of charts. Um, this is the, the so-called Great Acceleration, which um, physical scientists as well as historians have collaborated uh, to put out um, several years ago now, this series of graphs, which shows that on almost every one of these indicators, a very, very sharp upturn in anthropogenic impact on the earth and planetary systems uh, around 1950. One of the critiques of the great acceleration narrative is um, that perhaps it obscures as much as it reveals. And one of the things it obscures is the different and distinctive trajectory that the world's two largest countries, India and China, have taken uh, towards where we are at this moment in the 21st century. Um, this is a very interesting recent piece by Liz Chatterjee, historian of energy in South Asia, who talked about late acceleration. And Chatterjee's point, and, and others have made a similar point, is that the great acceleration narrative um, really tells us about the global north, if we want to use that term more than anything else. Uh, what we need to understand is how it is that very, very late in this process, um, we see a rapid increase in the impact of China, first and foremost, and secondarily India, uh, to these planetary aggregates. Uh, Amitav Ghosh in The Great Derangement put it this way, he said that you know, at the very end of the 20th century, what we see is a small increase in the footprint of a very large number of people in India and China. And, and I think that bears out. One of my aims today is to think about how important the 1980s are to that shift. Um, I want to start by pointing out, though, that it is not in the 1980s that that really takes hold. I mean, this is a, a familiar graph to all of you, energy consumption, the US at the top, uh, China here, India here. You see that even by 2000, uh, the increase in uh, um, energy consumption in India and China is, is, is modest. And in the case of India, it's, it's really not a very sharp uptick at all. Um, what you see in China is that this is really a phenomenon of, of early this century. It's a very rapid increase in, in energy consumption. But let's look at this on water, and it's a slightly different story. Um, one of the things that I think we need to think about is there has been an understandable tendency to focus almost exclusively on, on energy use and on carbon emissions and thinking about um, the environmental crisis that we find ourselves in. 
Um, and I think whether you're looking at it from India or from China, water is a really vital part of this story. And here you can see that the overall in green is the BRICS, and this is from our world in data. Um, you see that by 1980s, uh, again, the gradient is not that sharp. It's, it's quite a jagged line in many ways, but nevertheless sort of an aggregate um, contribution to global freshwater use. Um, it really significantly expands come the 1980s, and I'll talk about a few reasons why that is uh, the case. But I wanna start as a historian must with, with something of a puzzle. And that puzzle is the surprising invisibility of water, of rivers in the immediate aftermath of the revolutionary transformations of the 1940s across Asia, and especially in relation to the relationship between India uh, and China. And there's a sense that Asia's mid-century political transformation was so rapid, so dramatic, uh, so violent, uh, that very few people gave any thought to its environmental consequences. The partition of India was an exception. There, there was a sort of direct consequence in the partitioning of the Indus and Ganges basins. And there were uh, both conflicts and attempts at uh, negotiating uh, the Indus Water Treaty, for example, which is signed by the end of the 1950s. But when it comes to the relationship between India and China, um, water is largely invisible. It's only in the 1950s and into the 1960s that the beginnings of concern um, can be found. And a lot of that has to do with, of course, the great post-colonial project of the 1950s and 1960s, uh, which is, of course, dam building. And large dams in both India and China uh, symbolize the aspirations of these new political uh, regimes for an industrialized, developed uh, future. When Zhou Enlai visits India in 1956, the first place Nehru takes him is to the Bakra Dam. Um, and so initially, this is not so much a question of, of, of competition, but really something of a shared project. Um, in 1954, India's two leading water engineers, uh, Kanwar Sen and K.L. Rao, go on a tour of China's water projects. Um, and they're some of the first foreigners to really uh, see them in all of their comprehensiveness. Um, and they write this detailed report, very impressed by what uh, China has achieved. And then there's a glitch, and I think that glitch is in some sense uh, a foreshadowing of trouble to come. The glitch is when they come back to India and they publish their report, uh, the Indian Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, is deeply alarmed by the maps in the book, because the maps in the book show the borders where the Indian state does not think they are. And this report in the late 50s is withdrawn from circulation, actually remains that then after the 1962 conflict, it remains a classified document for many years uh, thereafter. So that was a very sharp shock that this is actually this was a report entirely admiring of the Chinese experiment in, in water management, really drawing lessons for India from what China had achieved. And, and Sen and Rao are the architects of you know, the kind of project that here is pictured in this you know, India's monumental, uh, what Nehru called the temples of New India. And Sen and Rao looking at China and saying, actually, they've gone much further and faster than we have. We can learn from this. And yet in the end, the maps. Um, trip them up. That is one moment, I think, where it begins to seem that actually water uh, may not simply be a matter for uh, the sharing of ideas and policy approaches between India and China. By 1960, um, recently declassified material in the Indian Ministry of Foreign Affairs archives show that there are conversations going on, but that the conclusion remains that water is unlikely to become a source of conflict. Um, in 1959, it's actually the Dalai Lama in exile in India who's one of the first to raise the alarm in a public meeting. Uh, in 1959, he charged that the Chinese state was, quote, planning to build high dams across the Brahmaputra and across the group of rivers in the Tibet region. Um, the Indian Ministry of Foreign Affairs immediately started to look into this and they responded uh, cautiously in a confidential note saying, we have no information, they're writing back to Delhi, we have no information so far about any proposal by the Chinese government to construct dams across the Indus or the Brahmaputra rivers before they leave Tibet. Um, there's a little side note in that document that says we need to be alert to this. A few years later, 
um, another series of reports is coming in, often from Indian border posts, quite possibly by intelligence agents. Um, they're marked as coming from a, a trading post, but, but it's quite likely that this is also intelligence. By this point, the Indian Ministry of Foreign Affairs is concerned enough to uh, write to their colleagues in the irrigation department saying, what do you think? Do you think this is viable? Do you think we should be worried? And the chief engineer of India's irrigation department uh, replies and says that substantial or imminent diversions by China for irrigation purposes in Tibet do not appear to be practicable. He raised a darker prospect. It says, if the Chinese hydroelectric schemes are so projected as to divert substantial quantities of Ramaputra water away from the present course, this could be a significant loss of valuable water resources. But he concluded, and I mean, this is the point I want to underscore, says, no doubt we will be given timely information regarding any observed or reported activities. Um, at the moment, we do not think it is technically or financially viable. So this is a situation in the 1960s. Um, people are not unaware that water might become a source of conflict, but really there's a dismissal of that prospect. And the reason for that, of course, is, is that there were no schemes to dam the upper reaches of the Himalayan rivers in the 1960s. Um, most of the Indian and the Chinese schemes are really focused on the, uh, on the lowland river valleys at this point. Um, nevertheless, there, there are, there's a sort of portent, starting with the censored maps uh, going through the 1960s, uh, a sense that things could shift, that things could become different. Um, I was, I was actually surprised when I came across that material in the archives. In, in a sense, I was expecting, at least I was conditioned to expect, a, a longer history to this conflict than actually I found. And, and in fact, it was surprising that as late as the 60s, this is really sort of dismissed as a non-issue. So this brings me to uh, you know, the main focus of my talk in the 1980s. So what happens? late 1970s into the 1980s to completely transform the situation. I think this audience doesn't need uh, telling uh, about how transformed the situation, of course, becomes by the beginning of the 21st century. Um, the first part of that history is, is a material transformation, um, increasing water demand, uh, which at some level comes uh, simply from uh, population growth. Um, Indian and Chinese uh, rates of population growth had, had both significantly reduced by the 1980s, uh, but in the 1970s, which in some sense was the peak, um, India, for example, added 131 million new citizens. Although that population growth had slowed significantly by the 1980s, not least because of population control measures, as, as we all know, uh, the cumulative impact of the previous decade's growth, I think, was manifest. But contrary to the kinds of Malthusian fears, which were very prevalent in the 1970s, um, the effects of this expansion on the biosphere were initially limited by very, very low levels of per capita consumption. Uh, so even though you have a major population growth, that is not in and of itself a driving large increases in water demand and certainly not in energy demand. As we saw from that graph I put up earlier, I mean, actually energy demand grows quite slowly uh, in the 1980s. But what we really see in the 1980s is, is, of course, the economic transformation of both India and China and a whole raft of other kinds of demands on both water and energy, um, which start to, to escalate. Um, and for the most part, we should and we can and we do tell these as two completely different stories. I mean, there's China's trajectory in the 1980s and there's India's trajectory in the 1980s. And in a sense, they're not really connected. These are each... Uh, very much domestically driven uh, projects of development. Um, at best, we can compare them. We can compare them and, and in, indeed we're likely to be struck by their differences in pace and trajectory and causation. Um, in a sense, what connects them remains initially invisible and, and that is the environment, that is water. That is the fact that at some point uh, these projects, these uh, massive expansions that you see again, particularly in China, uh, come into contact with uh, one another. Um, this shows you uh, one of the most significant features of, of what you see in India from the 1970s onwards. And, and David Peetz's work on China really suggests that something quite similar is going on in China, which is to say you have an inversion of the map of water. The driest parts of India, and these areas shaded in red are according to the aridity index, 
become the most uh, important centers of agricultural production, nowhere more so than the Punjab, which, which ends up feeding almost all of India. So you have this inversion of, uh, you know, historically, it was the monsoon lands, it was the river valleys that had always, right up to the middle of the 20th century, been very heart of agricultural production. You start to see this map reversed. It is reversed not by large dams, but, but by groundwater more than anything else. So the driving force, and this is something I want to pick up on later, um, actually, despite the fact that 1970s see the absolute peak of large dam construction in India, um, most of the water supply for the agrarian transformation of India in the 1970s with the Green Revolution is, is coming from underground. And India becomes by far the largest user of groundwater um, in the world. It'd be interesting to, to talk a little bit more, especially from those of you who, who, who are specialists in the Chinese story at this point, what, what is going on there. But I was struck by the parallels when I was uh, looking at David Peet's work uh, uh, about how there's a similar sense in which sort of arid areas uh, enjoy a kind of irrigation driven Korean revolution boom uh, in China uh, as well. But this is the material transformation. Um, I want to talk about the history of ideas here, because I think there's also a shift that takes place in the 1980s that allows these trajectories to be put into conversation. And um, the title of my uh, talk, uh, Collision Course, I think captures only one part of that. Um, there was no necessary sort of collision between these projects, but that begins to be visible in new ways in the 19. 80s. Um, I'm particularly struck by a book by the economist Harry Oshima, who was published in 1987, and it was called uh, Monsoon Asia. That's a very old colonial term. I mean, it's one I've, I've written about in other places. It's this idea that the monsoon shapes every dimension of life in this swathe of Asia that stretches from the eastern India right up to southern China. What's interesting is Oshima, who'd worked for the UN and the Rockefeller Foundation in the Philippines in the 1970s, he's essentially writing the epitaph of monsoon Asia. And the whole point of his book is that this doesn't matter anymore, that there is a kind of infrastructural revolution in irrigation above all, that means that there has been a, a sort of separating out of the trajectories of these different parts of monsoon Asia. I mean, he begins with this kind of ideal type, what he calls the philosophy of the monsoon economy. And many of these are, are, are old stereotypes. He wrote that the monsoon economy of rice cultivation uh, brought an ethos of harmony, compromise, moderation, diligence, and cooperation. But what he saw happening was that the old monsoon Asia had, in his words, crystallized with a few modifications into the three basic regions of East, Southeast, and South Asia. And writing in 1987, he was least uh, optimistic about South Asia's trajectory. What he saw was essentially that East and Southeast Asia had, had escaped the monsoon. He almost put it in those words. And I think that tells us a lot, perhaps, uh, about, um, the relative absence of environmental considerations in the trajectories of development that you see from this point onwards. The 1980s though also see the rise of an increasingly interconnected environmental movement across Asia. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the uh, centers of that is, is in Penang. It's the third world network that was formed in Penang in 1984. It's an offshoot of the Consumers Association of Penang. And that becomes a really interesting meeting point for environmental activists from across uh, the region. Uh, the Consumers Association of Penang publish uh, this citizen's report on the state of the uh, Malaysian environment, which is enough to inspire Anil Agarwal and the Center for Science and Environment in Delhi to do the same. Uh, the Third World Network begins publishing the work of, amongst others, Vandana Shiva, who's taking this kind of regional perspective on um, the unsustainable path to development that they were seeing all around them. And, and she focused very much on uh, water use. And what was interesting was the Third World Network began to also connect with activists in Latin America and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, what was very interesting, though, is it, it's there even in the name, the Third World Network. This was a meeting point of activists, each of whom really nevertheless saw um, their environmental problems very much in national terms. So this was about bringing together um, Indian environmentalists, 
um, environmentalists from other parts of Southeast Asia. Indonesia was very uh, heavily represented in this. Uh, China, of course, to a lesser extent, but nevertheless, there was discussion of, of China. But nevertheless, the map of the world that was animating these um, environmentalist conversations in the 1980s was the map of, of the third world, was a map that actually sort of each country um, had its own environmental problems and there were lessons to be learned across them. What they didn't talk about almost at all was what we think of now as, as transborder environmental problems. And those really came much later. I and mean, the environmental activists of the 1980s are not talking about water. They're not talking about the Himalayan rivers as, as necessarily this sort of shared problem. What they're talking about is river pollution as a problem each individual country has to face. Um, and this spills over into the way they first start to write about climate change. Um, the very same Center for Science and Environment in Delhi uh, writes in 1991, a text that I think remains very powerful and very influential. And it was called Global Warming in an Unequal World. And the very first sentence of that is very stark. They write, the idea that developing countries like India and China must share the blame for heating up the earth and destabilizing its climate is an excellent example of environmental colonialism. That's the opening gambit. And of course, this really shapes the whole position that of course, India and China until much more recently take in global uh, climate negotiations that we didn't create this problem and we are not going to hold back our own development. Um, the idea that developing countries like India and China must share the blame for heating up the earth is an excellent example of environmental colonialism. Um, their conclusion is equally interesting. Their conclusion, they're writing in 1991, just when that very idea of the third world is, is starting to fall apart. Their conclusion is, the third world today needs far-sighted political leadership to resist calls by Western political leaders and environmentalists to manage the world as one entity. Because for them, that was a mask for exploitation as long as the world remain, remained uh, so divided. So it's very interesting saying this is not a planetary problem. This is not a global problem. Um, and that treating it as such is, is, is a mode of erasure. But what's in a sense ironic with hindsight is the timing of that pamphlet. That pamphlet is published in 1991, just on the eve of India's economic liberalization, um, on the eve of India's emergency IMF loan that in a sense is the trigger uh, for, for, for all of the uh, legislative and policy changes that follow. And in that sense, in its language, it belongs to an era that was basically closing. What it failed to see was just how quickly and how thoroughly uh, capitalism would transform energy and water use right across Asia, including in India, uh, including in China. So, so in a sense, it's very, it's the end of an era as well as sort of giving us a discourse that remains very powerful uh, right through the 2000s and into the 2010s. So just a little bit then about the sort of trajectory thereafter. My, my point is not that these changes really um, accelerate in the 1980s, they don't. It's more that the political and economic conditions of the 1980s um, are the starting point for, 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 for what we, we can now see happens uh, next. I won't say too much about the contemporary situation because I'm you know, eager to hear from Sophia about that, particularly in relation to the new project. Um, just say a little bit, I mean, like many people, I've spent, I think, the last 10 years thinking about Ken Pomerantz's piece, The Great Himalayan Watershed. You know, for me, that was one of the really eye-opening interventions. It was, I think, 2009. Um, I spent, you know, 10 years thinking through the implications um, of that. And one of the things that, that I just want to sort of bring to the table in relation to that, it's a point that Pomerantz himself makes primarily in relation to China, that it's only in the 1980s that the project of dam building in the Himalayan rivers really accelerates from Tibetan Plateau in the Chinese case. In India, again, it does not happen until the very, very end of the 20th century. Um, and yet here we are, uh, if all of the schemes are currently under construction or on the cards uh, for dams in the upper Himalayas come to fruition, there will be a dam every 32 kilometers in the Himalayan region. It will become the most heavily dammed in the world. Um, a complex of uh, often very secretive public and private interests converge uh, 
data on water flow, as we well know, is, 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 is highly classified and it's taken you know, NGOs like Third Pole to try to make some of this information uh, a little bit more open source. Uh, one of the ways in which um, I think the situation is far more complex than say the heyday of dam building in the 1950s and 60s is of course it's not just state interests involved here. Um, and there's a very interesting story about the globalization of the Chinese dam building industry uh, beginning in its own neighborhood of, of the Himalayan uh, rivers. I don't need to tell this audience of course how uh, Thoroughly, uh, environmentalist warnings have been disregarded in the entire region when it comes to building these large uh, dams, the impacts on uh, biodiversity, the impacts on displaced uh, local communities. Um, just earlier this year, of course, we had a, a, a landslide and major damage to two dams um, in uh, Uttarakhand in India. This is in uh, Chamoli. Uh, most of those injured and killed were construction workers. I was very struck by the chief minister's response. One of the first things he said after this was, we shouldn't let this lead people to adopt an anti-development narrative. And so there's still this really strong sense, in a way, a sense that goes right back to the 40s and 50s, that these dams are development, that to be against them is to be anti-development. So very, very striking formulation. Almost in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, the chief minister of the state felt the need to say, we shouldn't let this uh, lead people to adopt an anti-development narrative. Um, there are major protests going on here at the uh, Subansari hydroelectric dam on the um, Brahmaputra on the uh, border between Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. Um, and these have proceeded despite the fact that dams have mobilized probably a larger number of people in both India and China and indeed in Myanmar than, than almost any other major uh, political issue. Um, the sort of history of protests against these schemes, again, goes back to the 1980s. Think of the Narmada movement. Think of the really significant movements that you have in China, um, that they become a flashpoint for local concern uh, and indeed for sort of national level mobilization. Um, and yet they keep going. Two years before this dam collapse, a uh, local group uh, filed a writ petition with the court pointing out the enormous risks that were being taken. The Indian Supreme Court uh, ruled that construction should stop on many of these upper Himalayan dams, completely disregarded. And there's an additional irony in, in the fact that this dam building in the upper Himalayas proceeds apace, regardless of critique, regardless of concern, regardless of risk. This is the latest report of the IEA's India Energy Outlook. And there's one thing that's striking. Hydropower is nowhere <laughs> on that list. Um, but despite the fact that, first of all, there's a projection that, that uh, solar is, is likely to increase very rapidly in the coming decades. Um, that is just a prediction, but nevertheless, that's the projection. Uh, coal powered plants, of course, are. Um, Never continue to reign supreme, but but it is interesting that that hydropower has never been a very significant part of the Indian energy mix, and that in some sense, just as happened in the 1970s, the large dams were not providing India's irrigation water for the green revolution. That was coming from groundwater. They were built anyway. Similarly, now hydropower is not that significant to India's energy mix. The dams are being built anyway, um, and there's something about the the unstoppable nature of that project, which as a historian of science and technology, I'm, I'm very interested in perhaps discussing further and trying to unpack why do, why in a sense, is it the material interests behind them? Is it the imagination that these symbolize progress and to stop them would be um, to turn one's back on development of a particular kind? I mean, this is an open question. I'd be very interested to hear both from uh, Sophia and from members of the audience about this. Um, so just a couple of comments in, in conclusion. Um, I'm a historian, not, not a water policy expert. And when I think about this, um, I'm always struck by a comment in Jed Purdy's wonderful book, After Nature, in which he, he writes, the material world that we inhabit is in many ways a memorial to a long running legacy of contested ideas about nature. That is where I think the 1980s are really interesting. Um, that actually, if we think about the whole breadth of India-China relationships in the 1970s and 1980s, I think we start to see some of these contested ideas that 
underpin uh, the landscapes of risk that we look at uh, today. And I've said de deliberately said nothing about climate change as a sort of ultimate risk. I'm hoping that's something we'll very much uh, come to in conversation because I think it's on everybody's minds. I mean, in a sense, that's the greatest risk of all when it comes to all of this dam building. But if we think about how we get here, I think there's something to be gained from thinking about a much longer history of comparison between India and China, about anxieties and fears, about hopes of emulation. I think we could learn a lot from thinking about the history of visualization. What happens when we first get satellite images of the third pole? It's only again in the 1970s or 80s that that phrase really kind of catches on. What does that allow us to see? On the one hand, it allows environmentalists to see how these rivers transcend all borders. On the other hand, I think those very same images, those very same maps kind of fuel a kind of geopolitical anxiety about water and turn it into this competitive quest. Um, historian Sverka Serlin has written about environing technologies, and that's how he describes satellite images. It allows us to imagine landscapes and environments in a different way. And, and I think there's something uh, promising in thinking about how the ability to see uh, the Himalayan region and the waters in a new way, beginning in the 1960s, but again, really sort of gathering pace in the 70s and 80s, um, allows different kinds of claims to be made. And those claims may be contradictory claims. They may be the claims of environmentalists who argue for more cross-border cooperation, or they may be the claims of, of those like in Brahma Chileni or somebody who, who's uh, absolutely fixated on this being a zero-sum game heading for water wars. Um, Finally, I think there's something to be said about the history of prediction. At what point do these predictions of water conflict, these imaginaries of the future, um, to some extent become self-fulfilling, become a matter of common sense that is then repeated again and again? Um, and the final question, um, thinking about, say, Prasenjit Dwara's book, um, you know, uh, about Asian traditions and, 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 and sustainability, the crisis of global modernity. One of his chapters is called Network Asia. And, and he has what I think is quite an optimistic idea that, that NGOs, uh, many of them inspired by, by religious ideas, ideas of transcendence, uh, might hold the key to seeing these conflicts in less bordered and bounded ways. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's happening, but it would certainly be as a subject uh, for conversation and, and I hope also for further research to think about other visions of, of water sharing, um, visions of uh, cross-border cooperation, because there's a history of that too. And that history goes back to the 1940s or 1950s. Um, and we can look at that as well as the sort of uh, collision course. I mean, I should have put a question mark in my title really, uh, because that's what I'd like to, to end with. Thanks very much. Thank you. And before I turn the, the platform over to Sophia, let me just, uh, because I didn't in my opening remarks, um, invite the audience to uh, place your questions in the Q&A box. And uh, after the conversation uh, is concluded between Sunil and Sophia, we will uh, get to the audience questions. And I'm sure they're going to be a great deal. I, I already have quite a few, especially on, on the last uh, 10 minutes of, of uh, Professor Amos' uh, very, uh, very insightful remarks. So thank you uh, both, and I'll turn it over now to Sophia. Well, this was a fascinating talk to Neil, and it just opens so many questions. Now you've opened it to, in so many different directions. But I'll start by saying that, um, I'll start with the visual. And one of our, um, as you know, the, the through the Geopolitics and Ecology of Himalayan Water, we've hosted different webinars and guest speakers. And one uh, woman was a mountaineer, and she said, well, we were trying to climb the mountains and the cook said, I think we're gonna have to paint the mountains white because there's so much less snow every year that the mountains are getting dark. And in our mind's eye, we have this image of Everest that is glowing in the sunlight with blue skies and, and is completely white. And this is changing. And I think what you said about visualizing, first of all, visualizing the region itself uh, understanding that we're the height of these mountains, sort of the geography. I, I loved how in your book you added a satellite uh, image, but I think I would almost want to have more of a 3D 
uh, idea of how this is the roof of the world um, and, and how this is, it's, it's dramatic in and of itself. Um, so a couple of things, I mean, there are many things that we can unpack here, but one of the things that I was thinking about was as I was listening to Joe Biden and Xi Jinping speak at the UN, um, there seems to be an idea, okay, so we're embracing that we're in this climate crisis moment, and this relates to everything that you were saying, but there continues to be uh, talk of science-based solutions. They both said, science is going to guide us. Science is going to tell us what to do. And not capitalism is dictating or our economic system or our consumption patterns or what we call modernity and civilization, but this in emphasis on science. And so I wanted to ask you about that um, because you know, also when in your book and, and in your talk, so much of the collaboration is happening between scientists but it's politics that are making the difference. And I'll talk about the fraud geopolitics in a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question, Sophia. And I suppose this is a, you know, this is a theme that historians of science and technology in both India and China have um, delved into for 20 years now. I mean, in a sense, every, every time I think of it, I go back to Jim Scott seeing like a state, and, and you know, in some sense he said it all uh, 20 years ago in this, the idea that there is something ironclad about this idea of a, of a technocratic path to development. And you see traces of this going back to the late 19th century um, in, in India and of course in, in, in China as well. And I can think of David Peetz's work about all the schemes in the 20s and 30s, um, often transnational schemes of water engineers sort of um, you know, engineer China's rivers for the future, engineer India's rivers for the future. In the 50s, yes, it's two water scientists from India who are coming to China and trying to learn what very interesting in the appendix to their report, they list every single water scientist in China that they meet. Um, and, and there's this sense of a kind of collaborative a scientific fellowship. Um, and there's a sense, exactly the sense that we still live with, this is somehow beyond politics, that is somehow beyond ideology, that, uh, and I think this is very sincerely held, I and mean, this is one of the things to point out, I mean, if you read uh, the memoirs of, of some of these Indian water engineers, and a couple of them did leave quite fascinating and insightful memoirs, and they're insightful as much for what they don't say as, of course, what they do say, but there is this real sense that it's a higher calling. And, and just to give that one other part of context, um, even in India today, when since the 1990s, uh, streets have been renamed, uh, statues have been taken down, cities have been renamed to, to sort of erase the colonial past. In fact, the one group of colonial officials that still have a reasonably good reputation in India are, are water engineers. Um, you know, there's a statue to Arthur Cotton who engineered a lot of the Southern rivers um, in Rajamandri, in Hyderabad. The sense, um, there's a farmer's association named after him that celebrates his birthday every year. There is this sense that somehow, you know, even though they were colonial officials, uh, they were still sort of dedicated to progress and development. And in fact, the current river linking scheme of India um, often explicitly goes back to the 19th century and says, you know, this is a forerunner of the vision that someone like Arthur Cotton had of, of, of linking all the rivers. So I think there's this really deep set um, engineering mentality, a sense that science will solve it. Um, and, and of course, uh, the history of dam building and all of the sort of catastrophic consequences of some of these decisions um, doesn't derail that in any way. Um, you know, at most the acknowledgement is, oh, well, mistakes were made, uh, always in the passive tense. Uh, you know, calculations could have been better. And I think we're still very much in that moment, the idea that there will be a fix, there will be a technical fix, and that scientific expertise is above politics. Uh, and you and I know, of course, that 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 it is it is very far from from that. So a couple of things about this. The first thing is. Uh, we do know this, but yet the only avenues of communication in this moment in time, not the only, but the most robust, let's say, or acceptable, or are the ones, even in, 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 a, in a, a state of obscuring data uh, and not being really transparent, it seems as if there's, they're allowing the scientists to continue to talk to each other. 
uh, across the boundaries. And a lot of the institutions and initiatives are, are really meant to foster this kind of data collection, however accurate it is, and to exchange these uh, ideas of how to technically to resolve. But you did talk about the environmental movements uh, in the 70s and the 80s that really uh, brought it to the fore that there's more to this story, except civil society in that part of the world is also, uh, you know, the, the communications are being eroded or the trust or the, the abilities to talk to each other uh, are being limited. So uh, is there another way to bring in a different kind of knowledge production or these different points of view in order to at least enrich the conversation that's taking place because basically it's all siloed and repeating itself in a vacuum. And I think the second point you made, Sophia, is, is vital that, you know, actually the environmental movement in, in most countries in this region have less room for maneuver now than they did 10 or 20 years ago. Um, in, in fact, there's been a far more political restriction on what they can do, on the funding they can accept, and this has definitely been true in India. Um, I, you know, right, right down to straightforward repression. I mean, the number of environmental journalists in India who, who've been harassed over the last few years is, is very significant. So I think, you know, there's a much greater risk. What, what seemed perhaps the end of the 20th century, you know, around the time of the Rio summit and the World Social Forum, um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, what may have seemed as like the most promising space for this kind of conversation, I think has in many ways been shut down. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm not optimistic in the short term about a sort of alternative forum for that kind of exchange of ideas. I mean, uh, you know, then we end up with the irony that it's in privileged institutions like those we're speaking from that these kinds of conversations maybe do happen and can happen, um, you know, at the very least through visiting fellowships for um, environmentalists or environmental social scientists or humanists who are coming from different parts of the region. But you know, that's not a sustainable solution. That is itself a kind of privileged position to be able to comment from. Uh, so, so I do wonder where this will happen. And I certainly do see that of all the constructive things that may be done to broaden this conversation, uh, a way to bring in other voices um, is, is vital, but very constrained at the moment, I think. And so I do want to just quickly add, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to come across as suggesting that the kind of interactions between the scientists aren't completely vital because they are. I mean, in that sense, that, as you said, that, that's all we've got at the moment. And, and the more uh, they can exchange data and exchange ideas, I mean, I think that that is a, that is a good thing. Um, and it's more a question of enriching that conversation with with a social perspective, with a perspective of, of what are the impacts of these schemes on people's livelihoods or on people's um, uh, displacements, etc. So another thing that I was thinking about is the map, you talked about maps, and the map is changing, at least a geopolitical map. Now everybody is moving toward the Indo-Pacific. India wants to make sure that it controls the waterways, China is building fleets, uh, and really, and, and the US does not want to be challenged as the uh, how would you say, the gatekeeper of, of uh, free trade and uninterrupted uh, transportation of goods across the globe. And, but everybody's focused on another body of water, which is the ocean. And they're not focused on the major problem with the body of water, which is groundwater depletion, uh, melting mountains, floods and droughts, the monsoon changes, and also the consequences that this will have domestically. For example, how is it possible, is it possible actually to think that this kind of scenario, if it continues along these lines, may end up upending in the entire fabric and even the nationhood of countries in the region? So will, will these projects that you talk about moving the new irrigation projects to bring water from one part of India to the other uh, that are planned to continue, will that be enough to sustain nationhood or will we have states fighting each other? And how is it that we're really not talking about that kind of a development? That's that's a wonderful insight, Sophia. So so my the, the book I'm writing at the moment, a kind of it's a it's a global environmental history seen from Asia. I mean, that's the sort of angle of it. And I call it the ruins of freedom, 
precisely for that reason. The idea that in a sense, the irony of this whole situation is that it was the quest for a particular kind of material freedom, which has led so many countries in, in this region and around the world uh, to embark on these unsustainable paths uh, to development. Um, and that the ultimate effect of that, if, if we continue on this path, will, will I think be the ruins of, of many of these aspirations, uh, many of which are aspirations that are, are incredibly noble ones towards reducing inequality, towards um, uh, overcoming a, a colonial legacy of, of backwardness or underdevelopment. And, and I mean, I think there is this sense that, you know, how long can this continue? How long can the groundwater fueled food security of a country like India continue when the aquifers are as depleted as they are? I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but but it's it, it, it's it's a very, very alarming thing. Um, and that shift towards the Indo-Pacific is in a weird way, a kind of historical full circle. Because if you look at the 19th century, um, the British used to see India in very maritime terms. I mean, they're primarily interested in coastal India. They were primarily interested in India from the point of view of naval security. Um, you're very much interested in India and the Indian Ocean. And it's really only in the late 19th century that a kind of more Himalayan subcontinental perspective on India uh, comes to be much more significant. And that phrase, the Indian subcontinent, is an early 20th century coinage. Um, and, and you start to see a much more bounded and a much more territorial sense. Um, if you look at the um, Indian Imperial Gazetteer of the 1880s, um, that was the first time they sort of spell out this idea that actually the Himalayas are crucial both to our military security and to our water security. And there is this idea, which it seems to me now that with the kind of rise of, of, of strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific, there is a, and, and you do see this in some Indian Ocean studies, a sense of a kind of weird return to an earlier vision of the world in which this sort of maritime highway is really what people are focusing on. Whereas, you know, the 20th century story was mostly about self-sufficiency in food. It was about irrigation. It was about, um, it was about containment of a particular kind. And I think it's interesting that that is perhaps fading from view with all of the attention as uh, strategic and geopolitical to the Indo-Pacific. And, you know, I, I do feel that the, you know, the, the Himalayan rivers are maybe ignored, but those problems are only going to escalate. It's a very American story though, if you think about it. So I've always, uh insisted that that the US holds this really large bullhorn and that we're all the way that we're competing or the areas of strategic interest and the ways that the strategic interests are being played out and laid out for everybody to understand and then align themselves accordingly are really much uh, driven by uh, a bipolar logic that that is very dominant in the United States. Um, China has a little bit of a different approach. I mean, India does not like this approach. China's approach is actually looking into the non-coastal regions as well. In fact, the whole Belt and Road was an attempt to reunite Eurasia and Africa as a landmass. Um, is there an answer to that? I mean, there's criticism of that, of course, uh, but does that mean that they have a more I mean, is there something to learn from that? Perhaps it's not an ocean, it shouldn't be an overwhelming ocean um, competition or view of the world. I mean, again, there is this weird way in which at the beginning of the 20th century, all these British strategic thinkers, including Halford Mackinder saying, the age of oceanic competition is over. It's all about Eurasia once again. And you know, railways, the railways are going to transform this strategically. And, and, and you know, in a way, I think there is something to learn from that strategic vision that underpins the Belt and Road Initiative, which really is thinking in continental terms, which is thinking about um, this whole stretch of you know, the, the concentration of population in the world, what, what remains that? And, and, and I mean, I think the ways in which the Belt and Road Initiative has tried to link the landmass and the ocean are also interesting. The idea um, always underpinned with historical narratives, you know, there's the sort of Silk Road and the Maritime Silk Road. And, and, and I mean, it's very interesting to me how much history is invoked as a way to legitimize these um, you know, really completely unprecedented kinds of schemes, but nevertheless, this sort of um, 
there's a felt need nevertheless to give it this kind of deep history. So there's this deep Eurasian history. I mean, you know, it's interesting to me that one of the best-selling non-fiction books of the last 20 years probably is Franco Pan's Silk Roads, which, which apparently was a very, very big success in China. Um, and there's just something I think about thinking of Eurasia and all of those connections and the depth of the history of those connections, uh, which makes the current schemes legible in a different way, perhaps. Uh, and, and you know, the Indians have nothing to offer to compete with that, really. I mean, there was an attempt to think about, you know, Project Mossum as a kind of thinking about monsoon Asia, but it never had that same purchase as the Silk Road has, um, you know, the Silk Road now, the Belt and Road. Yes. Okay, I know Mark wants to open it up to Q&A from the audience. Mark, will you join us and assist us in uh, bringing these questions? Sure, sure. Thank you. That was a, a great uh, dialogue. And uh, I, I hope we can continue to keep the high quality. And I think we will. Uh, we have some excellent questions from, from the audience. And let me begin by asking one uh, from Kelvin Ng, who says, um, you know, does the scale and extent and or nature of water policy in India and China change in any substantial manner following the uh, structural transformations of the 1980s and 90s, liberalization under Rao, export led industrialization under in China under Deng, and have both their respective international ambitions today uh, had any influence on contemporary water policy? Uh, the international ambitions specifically referring, by example, India's Project Malsam and China's BRI, which we just mentioned. Uh, maybe I'll say I say a bit, and Sophia can too. Thank, thank you, Kelvin. Um, I think what you see is is really a kind of multiplicity of interests that come to be involved in water policy. Um, perhaps not an overall expansion in scale as such in the sense that Indian and Chinese water policy have always been from the 1940s and 50s onwards uh, conceived on a kind of national scale. Um, there's something integrated about the sort of whole project of dam building from, from very, very early on. Um, but what you see is, I think, first of all, the um, much greater importance in India, certainly, of, of private interests. Uh, so it's it's the, in a sense the scale is changing in the scale of who is involved in making these decisions, um, the scale of demand certainly, which is something that we talked about, um, and then the, the extent to which water policy is related to the sort of broader um, international ambitions. I think it clearly is, and it probably is partly refracted through energy and concerns about energy. Um, you know, really it's the hydropower potential of these Himalayan dams that's driven them. Um, not so much the water supply question, uh, which, which is parallel and, and at least as important, but something that's often been sort of conceived of or imagined differently. I mean, I think it's energy has tended to dominate, I think, the ways in which the international ambitions and domestic policy are, are, are coming together. But, but clearly the concern about water shortages and the concern about particularly future water shortages is, is right there at the nexus of the kind of global ambitions, the oceanic ambitions of, 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 of these countries and uh, you know, concerns about domestic policy and security. I would also just add that, that I think Sunil said this, but it's the financing, the availability of financing, the embracing of hydro as clean energy, as a natural way of powering our economies, uh, a way to not leave anything undeveloped or unexploited, if I might add. So th this, I, this is key to what was happening. I mean, there's a long historical tradition in these both these countries of uh, irrigation schemes and trying, I mean, the monsoon, of course, but also you know, supplementary schemes. In China, it's been a battle uh, with water from the get-go. So these are two really important issues, but I definitely think the financing and the way that we discussed, and America, again, was leading in all the dam building. Uh, and now we're going through the reverse. We're trying to take away some of these dams because we're realizing the economic and environment, I mean, the environmental implications of all that. And the waste of water resources by having them concentrated in this particular way. Um, 
great. So there's a question uh, from my colleague Manjari Mahajan, who uh, it, it kind of follows on this, which is, um, you know, if we might agree that China is not the best place to look for alternative visions of water use, what might be other places and forums that uh, might be sources for a more sustainable vision of, of water use? Sophia? <laughs> No, Sunil, I'm pointing to Neil. <laughs> um, I, 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 that's that's the ultimate question, really. Um, I think I have only the beginnings of an answer, but the answer is that it probably isn't at the level of a nation state. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the um, uh, Mira Subramaniam's uh, journalistic reporting on water from India, which I think is, is, is fantastic. Um, and, and she has pointed to the scales on which more sustainable approaches to water um, have worked despite this kind of macro context that we've been talking about. Um, the question, the, uh, the problem I think with pinpointing a kind of local um, success story to, to, to put it that way, is that it is to use maybe an unfortunate water metaphor, it's a drop in the ocean. I mean, there may well be one or two successful local uh, projects that are, um, for example, using small run of the river dams instead of sort of massive ones that are uh, you know, managing the flood pulse in a slightly more sort of ecologically uh, sensible way that are um, restoring mangroves and, you know, all sorts of ways of water harvesting, which you see in, in all sorts of parts of, of India and China, um, often at an urban level and sometimes cities are actually doing a pretty good job of this. Um, but we always come back to the scale question because the counter argument to every environmentalist critique is, is what's the alternative, you know, and, and it will always be a counter argument that is couched on the language of scale. Like how else are we going to feed this many people? Um, you know, how else are we going to deal with this quantity of water? I mean, that's very much the logic in India, which I know far, far better than I know China. Um, behind the river linking project. It's like any number of critiques of what impact there's gonna have, waste, displacement, pollution, um, uh, affecting the hydrological cycle. Um, and the answer is always, yes, but look at the scale of the problem. Um, and so, so I think we've maybe sort of trapped in that, in that our good models are very often much smaller. Um, and yeah, Anna Singh makes this point in her wonderful book on the mushroom at the end of the world. She says, you know, the, the logic of modernity, of development has always been to scale up. We, we don't know how to scale down or, or, or that isn't part of the repertoire or the logic. And, and I suppose that that's where we're, we're left at the moment. So this is, this is fascinating. We talk about this a lot in one of my classes about these false dilemmas because they do always come in these large questions that are very existential. One is, do you want people to starve? Therefore, if you don't, then this is the only solution. And I think that it does kill any uh, attempt for nuance. And then again, we get, we try to come up with examples, best practices. They're all, they all seem to be very small in scale. So you get trapped into the logic of, well, there's no great small scale master plan um, to answer this existential question. But the reality is that these are false dilemmas. And part of what I, I found fascinating reading your book and just thinking about this is how much we have to unlearn. Uh, from the things that we took for granted. For example, the Green Revolution was considered to be this huge success uh, when El Elric wrote the population bomb and all the critique that came with it. The solution, the, the response was, but you know, you were wrong because we've now had the Green Agricultural Revolution. But as Vandana Shiva says, is it really about more production or is it really more about theft? So these are questions that we have to keep in mind. And, and one of my, I guess, what I really want to see us all trying to do now is trying to not um, avoid complexity. Uh, these kinds of dilemmas always push us to say complexity, nobody understands complexity, we can't be nuanced, there's black and white, it's easier to understand. So in answer to the question, uh, there are many good practices, both local and with water sharing, like the European Union has come 
is dealing with rivers uh, in you know as uh, unified basins of water. Of course, it's in a different situation. Uh, but there are good practices and there are institutions and open dialogues already happening in Asia as well. But we need to we need to ask the right questions, I think, and not allow these same questions to keep getting asked to which we can only give piecemeal answers. Great, thank you both. Um, so I'm gonna try to combine two questions from the audience that uh, are both um, talking in some ways about uh, downstream uh, areas uh, from the Himalaya. And so one is from Abhitangshu Acharya, uh, who says, um, what are your thoughts on the downstream country of Bangladesh, which has little to say on the quantum and quality of water flowing through their country? Is there any lesson we can draw from South Asian history? And then combining that with a question from an MA student here at the New School in International Affairs, Bart Wasswinkel, uh, who uh, uh, has, uh, he, he says, uh, written on the damming of the Mekong subregion and damming of the Mekong and its other tributaries due to uh, over damming of the Mekong. Are we seeing, um, he says, we are seeing the, the lower river basin have an increase of soil salinity uh, because of, of the loss of water flow. Has India seen this happen? Uh, with its rivers and damming? Great questions, and they really do fit together. I mean, actually, I had a section I was going to talk about Bangladesh, and I, I didn't because I think it's crucial. Um, I mean, this is the irony when it comes to uh, Indian complaints about the prospect of, of a Chinese dam on the Brahmaputra. Um, because, of course, uh, downstream from there, um, there's been an extensive, especially with the Faraka Barrage, uh, there's been an extensive history of, of, of Indian projects to divert water, uh, which, uh, you know, Bangladesh as the ultimate downstream country has, has suffered, I think, profoundly from some of these schemes. Um, and, and then you end up with the that, that that ultimate problem of, of, of you know differential power relationships in being able to uh, stop projects that are across the border uh, from a more powerful uh, neighboring country and, and this is where it's interesting that there's really no water sharing treaty between India and Bangladesh uh, you know the in this treaty is troubled it's constantly under attack but but it's there <laughs> but when the Ganga Basin was partitioned in 1947, actually not, nothing was done. And the reason nothing was done was precisely because of the feeling, and this is also there in, um, uh, in our Jyoti Sakya's wonderful history of the Brahmaputra, there wasn't much plan to dam the Brahmaputra. It was seen as too turbulent, too sort of out of control in that sense. And so there wasn't the highly engineered waterscape you already have in the Indus space. I mean, that was the whole problem with partition 1947 is this was developed as an integrated area from the time of the canal colonies in 1900. And, and you know, even Radcliffe who drew his, his border said, you know, this is gonna be a problem because we're gonna break up these integrated units. That wasn't the case with the, um, with the Bay of Bengal region because the, the rivers were, were far less engineered. And, and so in a, in a way there is this sort of, um, you know, the fact that it was already so heavily engineered is what led to the need for this treaty, um, flawed though it might have been um, in, in, in the West uh, and, and in the East um, much less. So I mean, the Mekong is an interesting story. I, I'm, I'd be interested to hear Sophia's take on that. I mean, I, I'm, I just know much less about it. So I think that there's a, a common denominator here. The point is that, first of all, Again, I'm going to Sunil's uh, you know, comment on the visualization. We don't really see the rivers from their origin all the way to the sea. This is why we think of migration as happening because you know, there's flooding in Bangladesh. We, we see them again as isolated incidents. We don't really have, most of us don't even have a visual image of what the, does Mekong look like? And what does it look like for the people? In, in your mind's eye, can you really follow the story and how it becomes transformed and how the water, and in fact, I actually think that we need to do more work in this because we are living in a visual world and perhaps we need to 
expend and spend more time trying to, to document this so that people can understand, the public, civil society can understand that what happens upstream affects downstream. Uh, again, I, I, I can only say that we are seeing the, the effects on the Mekong. It's, it's a problem. Uh, there's pushback as countries understand that a lot of times these dams are not benefiting them either for the production of electricity or for uh, or or they lose control over the water or not even the water per se but the flow because all of these things matter the silt the flow the the timeliness of all of these things happening for the ecosystems so there is some pushback and definitely there needs to be more work but the visualization of all of this should be uh focused on Great, thank you. Um, I have a, uh, a, a kind of a return to the, the, the geopolitical problem that has come up a couple of times today. And this is a question um, uh, from Mark Selden. Hi, Mark, thanks for, for joining us. Um, and it's, uh, he says that the historical analysis and conversation today uh, brilliantly frames the contemporary environmental political crisis uh, that surrounds or is embedded in India-China relations, but he wonders whether it may not understate the gravity, the seriousness of the contemporary crisis, where we have the India-China conflict multiplied many times over now by the U.S. strategic initiative that Sophia mentioned, geopolitical, military, economic, technological, uh, you know, seeking to preserve uh, uh, preeminence in those sectors. So if we accept the primacy of the global eco-crisis in shaping the coming decades in the Asia Pacific and globally, uh, the US-China conflict, the India-China conflict, uh, now seeming to preclude cooperation, cooperative projects, which can begin to address these, uh, the eco-crisis, uh, which as we all know, continues to uh, worsen, even as we visualize and recognize it, it as such. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, Thank you, Mark. That's a that's a really important intervention. And um, if, if either of you have thoughts on, you know, how um, given the given the domestic political institutions and 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 issues and seeming intransigence to address some of these problems, along with the geopolitical, uh, are there any grounds that that we can um, can seek to, you know, as 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 centers or sites of mobilization uh, to, uh, to you know, make the geopolitical less preeminent in this context. I don't know if you want to go first. I, have... I just want to say briefly that I think, you know, uh, Mark, thank you for that sort of pointed out the occupational hazard of being a historian, which is, which is, which is maybe to underestimate what is really uh, dramatically new and different about the moment and 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 i actually tend to agree that i mean the gravity of of the intersecting ecological and geopolitical crises as you um you know eloquently point to is is unprecedented there's no question about that um and it may be and i you know other historians have written this about climate change writ large it may be that one of the effects of this is to is to make history less useful as a as a guide or, or to make historical perspective more disjunctive rather than sort of stressing any kind of longer continuities. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely open to that. I, I, I'll hand over to Sophia to say more about the current geopolitics though. Well, I believe that we need history because we can't be uninformed. I mean, nobody has been, has been born, um, how would you say it? Uh, we all have a history behind us and, and the nations do and, and the politics do and that we can see patterns that we can certainly learn from. Uh, but the current moment, I don't know how novel it is. It's definitely bad and very fraught, absolutely misguided um, because on the one hand, world leaders are talking about the climate crisis, which re requires uh, levels of cooperation and collaboration as we, like never before. And on the other hand, we have all these narratives of breaking ties of interdependence and deglobalization and uh, renationalizing uh, interests almost. Uh, our interests now are not woven uh, within our region. This, this inward 
thinking, inward looking uh, approach. I definitely think that there's a lot of space for pushback here. I, for, for a very long time, I mean, I've, I've almost become a broken record. I've been saying this bipolar competition is, is really the kiss of death for the climate. We cannot be uh, competing at every single level and then saying, but we will solve the climate crisis, which is all of the, it's everything. It's the water systems, uh, not only the water, but the water systems, the irrigation, the agriculture, land use, uh, everything, transportation. Um, there's not one aspect that the climate crisis does not impact. Inclusion, equity, we speak about inclusion and equity, and yet this is a narrative of division. So, and securitization of all relations. So we are, I think that there has to be a pushback. And in fact, we should be doing more of that perhaps uh, because it's, it's contagious. And I see that this contagion is ha taking place in Asia. Uh, and you see nations are trying to push back on this because they don't wanna live in a bipolar world. They see that they're more dependent on each other. They do, of course, everybody wants to be secure and unthreatened, but there is, but there is a sense, but the, but the narrative is so strong that it's really toxic. And, and this is a very important question and I'm glad you brought it up. It, it, I think it connects, the, the one possible side that Sunil mentioned was this, um, the Prasenjit's idea of the networked Asia and trans-border, transnational um, cooperation. Uh, and I think that does, as you said, it's worth uh, quite a few more uh, research projects and uh, I will, I talk to graduate students this afternoon. Uh, I think this is something to bring up uh, as they are uh, discussing, you know, dissertation ideas with me. Um, we have a, another uh, great question um, that that I was also struck by in one of the slides about the energy mix of, of India, and this is uh, from an audience member named Srinivas, who uh, says, as far as I understand, hydropower has not been a significant portion of India's energy mix, less than ten percent and remain largely the same. Dam building is not exclusively for hydropower generation, as we know, and the recent aggressive policy of India to promote hydropower has not really taken off for various reasons. Can I request Professor Amrath to reflect on the this supposed absence of hydropower as a significant part of the mix and the implications for the collision course with a question mark? Uh, that's, that's a, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and I'd put that actually in a slightly longer perspective because the same dilemma arises when it comes to dam building for, for irrigation. And remember until the end of the 20th century, irrigation was by far the largest um, use of dams in India. I mean, it's only really later that, that hydropower, at least ambitions for hydropower really start to escalate. I mean, the, the very significant proportion of, of, of the water impounded by dams went to irrigation use, but there too, dams were not a very significant source of irrigation water for India from any point after 1970. That all came from groundwater. Um, yet it continues. Same story. I mean, I think an optimistic reading of that energy mix graph would be, well, maybe we've reached the sort of peak of dam building. Maybe the, you know, the projected rapid increase in solar energy, um, will, will sort of undermine at least the economic case for, for some of these dams. And it might, but for the foreseeable future, I think these dams are going to continue to be built. And, and that's where I think, you know, what Sophia was saying just now about narrative, it's really important. Um, the idea that these are development, that these are strategically important, that these are geopolitically important, that these are um, environmentally important, the idea that this is a sort of key to, to, to clean energy. Um, I mean, I think, there's something very sticky about that, which is out of keeping with the material contribution of dams. Even if you take the development planners on their own terms, dams have not since the 1970s contributed that much to Indian irrigation, probably 20 to 30%. Um, groundwater is about 70%. Um, hydropower, as you say, about 10% in the mix has remained pretty much constant. There's, there's no clear sign that that's increasing anytime soon. Um, I would love to chart both of those uh, along with a kind of aggregate 
graph of the number of large dams being constructed. I mean, I, I believe the 70s were actually the peak of dam construction in India. It's just that since the 2000s, the construction has been concentrated in the Himalayan region, which is uh, that much riskier and, and both environmentally and geopolitically. Uh, but I keep coming back to your question. Why does this keep happening if even on a kind of cost benefit analysis, which is of course what drives the mentality of, of so many of these development plans, it doesn't seem to, and they're almost always over budget. And um, so that then brings us back to Sophia's question about financing. Um, there's quite a murky set of interests behind some of this. Um, not that easy to study. And if, and if anyone here has, has studied um, that intersection of, of interests propelling the dam industry, I, I'd be very interested to hear more. Well, they're also part of, a, of a, a power play for export. So India is building dams in Nepal. I mean, they are, this is, there's an expertise that becomes developed. There's a business, uh, how would you, a human or a, an expertise, again, a professionalization. I mean, that when you were describing how they went to China and watched these amazing engineers who had learned from the Soviets initially uh, become these experts in dam building, and it was incredibly admirable. And there is something, I have to say, this idea of reigning in nature. Uh, there is this narrative. I, I, I myself went to the Hoover Dam and I was amazed as they were describing, you know, how many people, how the cement is still boiling, how, you know, just the beauty of it. And, but in, in reality, it's a symbol of power, of expertise, of human um, uh, um, winning Conquest. over <laughs> this contest. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there's, but that too is misguided. But again, and this is part of why we continue to do this. We're trying to, to keep uh, responding to this fear that we had in a long time ago about how nature would overwhelm us to the point where nature will overwhelm us uh, again. So giving in, uh, uh, loosening up a little, li living with our surroundings, accepting um, this kind of that we are not separate. I think that, that uh, this is what's not really coming through. And for economic reasons, for, for state building reasons, power, uh, this is why we continue along this path. Yeah. I mean, th this uh, is a time I can quickly jump back in for a brief comment on the, the, the first couple of questions that, that coming in from the audience. And one, uh, um, an anonymous uh, attendee, um, ask the question of, about is, you know, when, when water consumption statistics are calculated, is the amount of water passing through dams included in that statistic? And second, uh, Peter Sly asks about pumped storage. So uh, hydro dams for energy storage can be used to balance solar, wind, and other intermittent low carbon power sources. Pumped storage, if properly cited, should not necessarily, he says, entail the environmental issues raised by on-stream facilities. Um, so a, a quick uh, granular kind of, a, 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 but important, um, you know, uh, discussion about the dams. Thoughts of either of you? Um, uh, bo both points well taken. Um, in terms of how water consumption is calculated, I mean, I think there are many, many different um, measures that are used. And, and, and so it's, I, I, I don't have a sort of general answer to that question. I think you'd need to look into the specific sources that we're, that we're, that we're dealing with. Um, pump storage, I mean, I think this is where we go back to what I, I really liked Sophia's idea of false dilemmas. Um, and, you know, I think we have reached a point where, for understandable reasons, um, you know, the environmental movement would be of the, you know, dams are evil. Uh, we should, we should, we should simply just not build them. Um, and I think there are ways in which, you know, especially not the sort of mega monumental ones, but, but smaller dams may, may well have an important part to play in a thoughtful, uh, holistic view of, you know, energy, water, uh, needs and 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 you know perhaps pump storage which I don't know anything about technically uh, may may well be uh, 
have a role to play within this uh, and maybe maybe you know there, there are different ways to build dams and, and the, I suppose one of the things um Arnab Ghosh's new work is very interesting um he's been talking about how we focus so much on the mega dams in China that we have lost sight of the fact that actually just as important are the sort of myriad of small ones and I think a similar point could be made of of India as well is it's not that there aren't more sensitive, smaller scale projects. And there are thousands and thousands of them. It's, it's just that um, the mega projects have both an outsized impact environmentally and socially, um, mm -hmm. and also an outsized attractive power because of you know, what Sophia was saying, that this sort of symbolizes our ability to master nature. Um, I have a, a, I think, what will be a wonderful question uh, again from Manjari Mahajan to to wind up on wind up this session on, and it's um, about uh, she's asking about the intellectual shift that may be necessary in how we analyze the politics of water. So drawing, um, she does on the example of the pandemic uh, that's showing us clearly that health uh, is you know tightly linked. Healthcare, public health, is tightly linked with issues of environment, trade, race, intellectual property, and much else. Um, what would it take then to have a similar kind, an analogous kind of shift in thinking about water, politics of water? Do we integrate it with energy, land use, health, uh, you know, rather than keeping it in these uh, siloed areas? So it's a nice, I think, way to wrap up the session as we talk about uh, the ways in which uh, history hum and, and other humanities, arts even, and visualization can um, you know, help us address these uh, problems that get too often siloed into areas of technocratic expertise. So well, I'll go so. first so Neil can wrap it up because he's our, our, our speaker today and I really want to hear his conclusions, but I will say two things. The first thing is, again, uh, we have these, these dilemmas about um, how we need water or bridge fuels in order to compensate for the lack of storage capacity for renewables. And this is the same story with natural gas. I mean, there's, there's a little bit of truth in everything. Um, and that's what I think we should be measured. And part of the, the problem is that all of these myriad, I think the word that Sunil used, myriad small dams that are complements to the big dams. These are networks, these are not, isolated infrastructures. And therefore, again, we can't say, we can't come up with a plan that's about removing one or two. There has to be a vision of what we want water to be able to do um, and how we want water to flow and how we want to use water. And in terms of uh, bringing it all together, if the pandemic taught us something is that we cannot think about one problem at a time. Uh, it's impossible. And, and politics doesn't like that because they need to show progress in order for, for it to be ahead of an election cycle. And even if it's not in countries that don't have an election cycle, there has to be progress so that there can be declarations and announcements. And again, we avoid complexity here. Uh, so all by way of saying, my thought is complexity should be where we're going. We need to weave everything talk about things as if they all matter as part of the same conversation and have a synthesis, a synthetic policy approach, not a siloed policy approach. And with that, I wanna thank everybody and pass it on to Sunil. Um, that's a wonderful uh, note on which to end, I think this idea of a synthetic approach. I mean, that goes back to what you were saying in your introduction, Mark, about the need for interdisciplinary conversations. I mean, I think one of the ways in which we get tripped up is when only a particular kind of expertise um, is involved in not just addressing a problem, but defining it in the first place. Um, in terms of the analogy between the pandemic and water, I mean, it's interesting. Um, many have pointed out that because of the dramatic, sudden, global uh, nature of COVID, um, it mobilized the scale of response that you know, we've possibly never seen. Um, just as many people die of air pollution related disease, uh, many more people indeed 
uh, or, 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 or of causes that are less visible that absolutely haven't galvanized any action whatsoever. Um, and I suppose it's the same thing with water. The thing is that water, the water equivalent of a pandemic is localized. I suppose that's the major thing. It, it's it's a catastrophic flood. It is um, you know a dam bursting its banks. We've seen all too many of those. But that doesn't globalize in the same way that this particular pandemic has done. And I wonder if that's one reason why um, it's difficult for me to imagine a kind of analogy to the an exact analogy to the pandemic as uh, in relation to sort of make jolting us into thinking about water in a more holistic and sensible way. I think the answer probably lies in the kinds of things that you know Sophia um, was was saying earlier and that we've been talking about today. You know, we at the very least need to be able to see water in its complexity. Um, I suppose. It's about finding new narratives that have complexity built into them that don't try to strip that out, but which nevertheless um, are as compelling as the simple stories that we are, are sort of more often being told. You know, what, is, is there a way of, of seeing and maybe even more that sort of feeling <laughs> um, how much water connects us and how integrated we need to be in thinking about it. And then that's where I think, you know, we're going even beyond the social sciences and humanities and, and, and you know, we are reaching into, into the creative arts in, in ways to sort of bring other visions and other voices into the conversation. Thank you. I, I think uh, the book of Genesis may have a, a, a global a water crisis that we can refer to, but let us hope we don't revisit that. Um, thank you both. Thank you so much, Sunil. Thank you, Sophia. And thank you to the audience. And before we shut down, I just wanted to remind you that uh, our fall uh, event series, which uh, is held on, on Thursdays, uh, not every Thursday of the semester, but we, we've kind of singled out this time of Thursday morning in the east uh, coast of the U.S. And that on October 14th, we'll have a, a talk on anti-Asian race, racism in the context of great power competition by Jessica Lee of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. So uh, please mark that on your calendars for 10 a.m. October 14th, another extremely important and timely problem to, uh, to be discussing. And we're glad to bring you that. With that, I will um, say thanks again. And uh, thanks to the New School's IT staff. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Grace and the ICI team. And uh, have a very nice day and a very nice evening, wherever you may be. Goodbye.